everybody, and uh, welcome to this installment of Frank and Mary here in Ashland, the COVID-19 edition. Uh, if you haven't seen this show before, my name is Art Bergeron. My day job, I am an elder law attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell. This show, though, is not about elder law. It's about my friends, Frank and Mary. If you've been to the Senior Center and seen my presentations there, you know that they um, and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., grew up in Ashland. And their goal is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And if you're in Ashland, that means you want to know the people and the programs you need in order to function well in Ashland. And I got this great um, co-host, Steve Mitchell, you're one of your wonderful selectmen, um, because he would inevitably get these great guests to be talking um, from folks from Ashland. We've talked you know, last week. We had the state rep. We talked to a number of the local officials about the COVID-19 response for folks that are, you know, stressing out about that today. But we thought that we would, we would bring in today someone who is not from Ashland, but who, who is doing this kind of work all the time. We've had her on the show before. Her name is Tammy Pazaricki. Thank you, Tammy, very much for coming. Uh, and she's here to talk to you about, uh, or to especially talk, talk to folks who have got someone who may have memory care issues and who are now kind of taking care of them and are feeling kind of abandoned because there is no one else taking care of them. Uh, or oftentimes they had people coming in to help out, but those people now won't go because they're very concerned about COVID-19. And so folks are trying to deal with this whole array of, of issues. And, and, but, but, and so Tammy, before you start, though, I wanted to ask Steve, you know, you're, you're kind of on the ground there as a selectman dealing with folks right now who are dealing with a lot of these issues. Are you, are there particular things that you're finding that are coming up that, are, you know, in this regard? Sure. Thank, thank you, Art. And hi, Tammy. Good to see you again. Hi. Uh, Tammy is not new to Ashland. She's, she's appeared on this show in the past, but she was also very, uh, uh, helpful and involved in Ashland becoming a dementia friendly community and so we thank Tammy for that and always a pleasure to uh, have a chance to to talk but Tammy right now what we've done as a community is is uh, uh, a number of things we, we recently I think it's been four or five weeks now that we uh, assigned a COVID-19 task force and we've got a, a police sergeant who's also a nurse as the head of that uh, task force. And so one of the challenges that they're, they're having here, you know, goes directly to, you know, a lot of the work that you have done with, uh, with healthcare facilities. And because they are densely populated, the ability for the virus to spread easily is what we are experiencing here, particularly one of our facilities, as well as a second facility and specifically in the memory care unit because of the way those are structured. So that's, you know, right now, uh, a, a major focus of the task force is managing that, that particular uh, populations. But, you know, beyond that, when you have, you know, you're, you're at home with a person that's suffering from Alzheimer's or dementia, you know, it, it, the challenges, we know that you've spoken so well about the challenges of the caretaker. And now, what does that involve for a, a caretaker and for a patient? So, you know, that's kind of where we are real quick as a community. You know, this and is Tammy, and Tammy, there, because of some of the things that Steve has said, if you can also, you know, talk to <coughs> those caregivers who have the, the, the kind of misfortune of actually having loved ones who are right now in a skilled nursing facility or, or in a memory care unit in assisted living, that might be really helpful, too. Right. Sure. Um, you know, this is a really an unprecedented time for the healthcare industry, as we know. But in terms of people living with dementia, um, particularly, this has been a very frightening, anxious, um, we're, we're seeing a heightened be, you know, sense of behavioral symptoms and psychological symptoms. And this is due in part from the general community of people living with the news every day and getting exposed to all the horrific numbers of deaths and people 
are very worried if they have a loved one in a nursing facility or in an assisted living because they are in close contact and it's particularly diff difficult for people living in memory care to stay in isolation. How do you tell someone with dementia that they have to remain in their room? that they have to stay apart from people when human connection and social socialization is one of the most important things they have in their life. Um, what I'm seeing now is that my business has really morphed into this virtual world of education and support for both healthcare professionals and caregivers that are now isolated in their homes 24 7 the adult daycare programs that are closed home home care is very limited at this point as a resource um, and there's those that are living at home with their loved one 24 7 who are in fear of letting anyone in their home um, so what i'm trying to do is reach out to people to say you can't do this alone, you need help, you need support, um, and there's a lot of support and resources out there that people just aren't familiar with. So virtually, we have lots of resources. Um, I'm talking to caregivers on how to self-care, how to prevent that caregiver burnout, and how, how do we build resilience um, with this for ourselves and our loved ones that we're caring for in this social isolation. Um, there's things to look at as far as challenges, understanding the symptoms of COVID in a person with dementia, because their symptoms may not appear like other people. We may not be, able, that, that person might not be able to communicate how they're really feeling. So I'm training people on what to look for in terms of acute changes in their behavioral symptoms. Um, and I'm also connecting people with resources like um, the Alzheimer's Association, virtual support groups, virtual memory cafes. Um, and I'm also doing some individual supportive educational sessions with people who are really in crisis right now. Um, so, Tammy, I want to I want to stop for a second just because you just went through a lot, but I'd in, be interested in, in your picking up on one, um, the, the notion of, of caregivers developing a greater awareness of COVID-19 symptoms that may be arising in their loved one who has dementia. Um, second, the, 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 the availability of these you know, virt virtual memory cafes or virtual places for people to connect to that folks may not be aware of. They may be thinking, well, you know, the senior center's closed and now, you know, the, and the, a lot of the daycare programs are closed and I'm just marooned here, you know? And yeah, then they feel like they're on an island. You're on an island and, and th you're th on an island with a very sick person, you know? And, and, and so, and thirdly, um, when you speak to the Alzheimer's Association, could you talk a little bit about what their resources are and how people might be able to connect connect with them. Absolutely. I think first off, we need to know the 24-hour helpline because that is for anyone, professional, personal, questions, crisis, uh, where there are clinicians to really re connect you with resources and help problem solve. Uh, that number is 1-800-272-3900. There's also websites um, that will connect you to virtual cafes to um, virtual support groups and education and those things we can provide the audience or they can contact me directly and I'll connect them. Um, I think it's really important that they don't feel like they're on that island alone because this has been a long stay at home and, and it's going to continue because even as we roll out this sort of getting people out and and expanding social distance, if you will, but the folks in nursing homes, the folks in assisted living, the folks living with dementia at home, they're at much higher risk. So they're going to be the folks that are on the last end of coming out of this. No. Um, the adult daycares, they will probably be closed for quite some time. Um, 
I think, unfortunately, Tammy, we're also dealing with a demographic that may not be as technologically um, hooked, connected. And so that becomes a challenge with the virtual world. And, you know, great concept. And I'm going to pass that on to our human uh, services department. But it may not be an option for, for unfortunately, many situations. There's many, many people who can't. Um, you may have someone visually impaired. You may have someone further along in a dementia disease process that just can't even grasp the concept. Um, there's a lot of pros and cons, um, and there's a lot of people not being served because of their limited use of virtual. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. This isn't reaching everybody. So that's, there's the need to reach out for that telephonic help. Um, and also, you know, someone like me, someone like the Alzheimer's Association that can really help to come up with a way to structure their day, engage in purposeful activity. What can they do with their loved one? Um, these are things that they need to really take care of themselves. I talk about diet and exercise and sleep and um, all those things that are going to help them get through this. So, um, can you, can, so Tammy, can you talk, and by the way, we're, we're going to ask the, the wonderful folks at, at um, Ashland Cable who've been so supportive of this show, you know, to, to, to put online, you know, your contact information and the contact information of, you know, the, the for, for example, the Alzheimer's Association, also any kind of virtual uh, memory cafes or virtual, you know, you know, places that people can get together. But can, can you, can, could you spend a little time talking about for that person, that, that kind of low tech person who is just trying to deal now with the day to day of that person who's got dementia about something you, I think you've often talked about this notion of how do you structure a person's day how do you think about a day in that way so so that this person can live through this? The, the, that's a great question because people living with dementia depend upon structure and routine. They depend on that. I would have people coming to my day program Monday through Friday, and on Saturday, they were getting up and getting ready to go. Um, they can't lounge around in pajamas all day, sitting in front of the TV, napping on and off, it's not good for them. So what's good is to find out what their, their uh, daily routine is like. With, when do they usually get up? When do they have breakfast? When do they have lunch? When do they take an afternoon nap, which is, should be a very short, quiet time in a recliner or a couch? You never want to put them back to bed in the afternoon. Um, the late afternoon becomes a, a problematic for caregivers because we call that sundowning. And that's when we see a heightened uh, symptoms of behavior. And we want to do what we can to keep them engaged, whether it's music therapy, um, because what we want to do is if we engage them all day in purposeful activity, when it's time for bed, they're going to get a better night's sleep rather than, you know, napping throughout the day and then they're up all night and then we see behavioral symptoms show up later in the day. This is actually going to benefit the caregiver as well, trying to maintain some sense of, of normal routine in their day. And that has to include getting outside, getting outside, taking a walk, um, you know, maintaining social distance. And these are the things that are difficult. They don't understand why they have to wear a mask. I'm sure they fight wearing a mask. Um, masks are also barriers to communication for a person living with dementia. Um, explaining to their loved one why why do we not are we not able to be with people you know it's kind of like the common cold you don't want to get that virus um, not it's killing thousands of people um, I want people to think about fiblets those therapeutic non-truths that are going to reassure that person a lot of what we see behaviorally is people not listening to the communication of what that person has for an unmet need 
and it's taking time to figure it out, providing some validation and empathy, and just plugging along and getting through the day. Now, as far as home care, there are agencies that are taking um, cases. They have There's home care agencies that have personal protective equipment that have been educated. Um, I implore families to call upon family members that have been in isolation who could come by and relieve the caregiver. It's all about getting that relief because you will not make it if you don't put your village in place, your village of care. So, and Steve, I, I didn't mean to be monopolizing the conversation. Steve, yeah. with, the, with the particular concerns you'd like Sandy or, or, or that Tammy to be talking about? No, I think this is great. I mean, I think, you know, she's, uh, Tammy has uh, described, uh, you know, the, the uh, exceptional challenges that, that caregivers have at this point in time. And I think there's exceptional challenges as well within the healthcare industry as far as how they manage, not just, not just dementia units, but I think across the board. And I think there's a spectrum of uh, situations where um, our, the facilities have, in, in, in essence, uh, created or enlarged the problem. And, uh, and, and I think to circle back to memory care units, because many of them are predicated on not independent living, independent rooms, but then uh, joint or common eating areas and common uh, entertainment areas, that escalates that, that, that whole issue. So I don't know, Tammy, if you, if you can reflect on that. Well, I have spoken with many professionals. Um, I, I provided a program on alleviating burnout in healthcare professionals right now, because I think we're gonna see a tsunami of people with mental health issues due to anxiety and depression from this um, explosion of COVID. These healthcare professionals that are on the front lines experiencing deaths, they are these folks that are actually could be the conduit between the family and the person dying and and the experience that families are going through grieving that they can't be with their loved one um, that they have these window visits that they're relying on staff to be able to communicate to them it's it's really um Something I, I, Dr. Michelle Ricard, a geriatrician, uh, we had a nice interview over the phone virtually, and sh her concern was the sort of denial of the human element, where um, we're not allowing people can heal better with people. People have a better and stronger will when they have their loved one by their sides, holding their hand, talking with them. So all these potential people with COVID uh, isolated by themselves, it's just such a challenge. I know for the memory care, it's almost impossible. It, it's, I know that they're having to really test um, the staff frequently, um, they're doing what they can to keep people safe, but honestly, ask, you know, think about it just yourself. Um, without dementia, how long could you really actually stay in a room or, or a little bitty apartment without coming out? Um, so I do encourage if these communities have the ability to get these people outside and social distance outside in the memory care gardens, um, it will help, absolutely help. And I, and I know that I've got, you know, it, from my perspective as a, an attorney, I believe we've been dealing with folks at this point who are just desperately, or not a lot, but several who are desperately trying to get their people out. They're trying to get their yeah. people out of these nursing homes and back home. And, and for those folks who had been thinking about the fact that they had a, 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 a loved one whose health, whose health or whose cognitive ability was deteriorating, and they were thinking about going to a skilled nursing facility or to a memory care unit, they're all thinking again. You know, they're saying to themselves, oh my God, you know, how could we, how could we, how could we can kind of condemn our loved one to these places? But, but then that goes to all the, issue, the other issues you were talking about. If you, if you can't be there, 
and you're trying to keep them home, it's, it's really, it's problematic. You know what? Mm -hmm. I, I did a training and I had a nurse, an ER nurse. Um, she was from Texas and um, now they're starting to come out a little bit in, in Texas, but she was speaking about how the ERs were getting full of people who were older with dementia because the families couldn't handle them during this COVID time. So, so that's what we're trying to prevent is sort of this, right. I can't do it by myself point where something bad happens. Right. Um, we know that burnout is linked to abuse and neglect. How do we build that resilience in the caregiver before it gets to that point? So. Steve, I'm sorry, I, I, you, you, I, was, I was cutting you off. No, I was just going to comment that I think in, in a, we're also in a lot of ways getting so much conflicting information from a variety of sources and uh, whether it's the healthcare, uh, uh, the, the, the medical industry, whether it's the, uh, uh, the politicians and, and, you know, the, 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 at the state level, at the federal level. And uh, it, it, but it's clear that, you know, there's so much confusion as to, you know, what is the, the, the proper way to uh, to behave at this point in time, and you know, uh, if you have a, a, one of, a loved one that you know you want to take outside in the backyard to get some fresh air, do you really need a mask? I mean, there's just so much of that. Oh yeah, there's so, there's some towns that it's mandated. You go outside your door and you have to have a mask on. You get fined. You know, so so all even all the towns have mixed messages. Yes. So Steve, I, I think that I, one of the things that I, I've heard Tammy talk about um, was, and then we talked about it a little bit, was this whole issue of being nervous, folks being nervous about hiring a caregiver or even keeping a third party caregiver right now because of these issues around COVID-19. And that led to the question about testing, you know, about, and, and, and I found myself talking about it with some other folks today about you know, kind of what is, what's the drill right now? What is, if, if I walked into the closest testing center, I know in, in, in my hometown in Marlboro, it's Marlboro Hospital, I don't know where that is in, in Ashland, but if I walked in, first of all, what would I need in order to walk up, be able to walk up to these people and say, give me a test? And then secondly, would that test be covered by insurance? And it, and it occurred to me, it may be interesting for us to find somebody. Are you, are you familiar with kind of where, if I wanted to get a test and I were in Ashland at this point, is there an obvious place that I would go? Yeah, I, I, how we've arranged it and structured is through our COVID-19 task force. So, oh. and we're, we're all, I think, predicating, uh, uh, our future actions on the fact that we're going to increase and enhance testing capabilities. So, um, you know, my recommendation is if, if you have a, uh, um, a family member that you want to have tested, you contact the uh, COVID-19 task force, and I'll get that information to WACA TV so they can put it on there. And, you know, they'll make a determination that they will be able to uh, facilitate the testing process. So that's right. kind of what's happening right now. And then at that point, you can start to do the, the, uh, uh, the tracing, the contact tracing. And so right, on. right. Now that, that, and that's a fascinating thing. And I guess I would just, and it's great that you've actually, you've actually consolidated that in kind of one place so that people, you know, to kind of town wide can really be looking at it. And one of the things that I would just suggest you may want to think about with that group is, the, is, this, is, is this notion once there is enough testing, well, for want of a better term, to go around, I know I'm, I'm told by the president that everybody can get a test who wants one. Um, but it, it, and at some point, maybe that'll be true, you know, but once, that, once that's the case, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, town-wide, you really want to be kind of looking at these potential caregivers of people going into houses with folks with dementia as kind of, you know, top priority, just for purposes of finding out whether they have it. So that the, fo the, the folks who are, who are hiring them can feel comfortable that they can come into these homes because it feels like it's like a, it's kind of a, a bottleneck now because of course you're, 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 if, you're the, if you're the loved one, right, 
Well, I oh, think, don't want to take the chance. I think at this point, our, the caregivers are given priority. My understanding is they are. Anybody oh, that, that's, that's, that's right. acting on behalf of whether it's a, it's a paid health facility worker or a caregiver, yep. they, they are given priority for, for that purpose. Uh, you know, I think it's clear, uh, you know, I'm not sure if either one of you watched the Senate hearings yesterday and listened to, you know, the, the doctors speak about this. And, and you know, we are, uh, you know, it was clear that testing and contact tracing was just a key part of this. We don't uh, anticipate having a, a vaccine uh, for a while. I mean, they're fast tracking things. Hopefully, we'll, we'll start to, to see some, some successes there. Uh, this concept of herd immunity, that's based on testing and, and contact tracing and so on. So it's, uh, you know, we're going to be in this, this environment for a while. For my, a while. Wish, my wish would be if we could somehow get folks who were enrolled in any daycare program tested and get them back with staff in a program um, I can't see that happening for a long time because then they're, you know, they, st they're still going to be social distancing, right. but the quicker we can get people back to these adult day programs, um, that's going to help for a lot of people. It's really going to help. Well, listen, T Tammy, I, I really, I can't thank you enough for, you know, be willing to, to be, you know, Steve's my guest today. Thanks for having I, me. And I think this has been really informative to a lot of people and, and we'll make sure that we put up all of that contact information. So if people need to reach you, need to reach the Alzheimer's Association, you know, want to find out about some of these other programs that they'll, they'll, they'll know where to look. Steve, thanks, thanks very much for, 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 uh, for doing these shows. I think they've really been helpful for a lot of people. You know? I, I absolutely think they've been, uh, you know, we've, we've had a, a variety of great guests. I think we've, we've kind of uh, touched a lot of, a lot of very important topics. You know, having a great guest like, like Tammy is always a, a treat. And, you know, hopefully we, we're, we're, we're providing good information. Thanks, so, Tammy, Steve. Th thanks, thank Tammy. You, thank you, th Tammy. Thank you, Steve. Thank you once again to the wonderful folks at Ashland Cable TV. Uh, and we hope you enjoyed this show and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next installment of Frank and Mary here in Ashland, the COVID-19 edition. Thank you very much. Thank you.